Thank you. <laughs> I'll take all the luck I can get. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait for a few seconds uh, as everyone joins. It takes a little while for the Zoom webinar to populate. So hold on one sec, and then we'll do a proper introduction. So this is an interesting event in that we are moving from our usual nighttime slot to a lunchtime event. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophers at the New School, this is... Yeah, I don't Unnatural. know my colleagues in daylight. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Jay, you reminded me when uh, I first came to the department, the department didn't open until noon. That's right. That's changed. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, the numbers are leveling off, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, it's my very good pleasure to welcome you all to our event today. I'm Zed Adams, the chair of the philosophy department here at the New School for Social Research. And this is another installment in our summer talk series that we've organized for the NSSR. It's called The Current Moment, Perspectives from the Social Sciences Humanities. And in the chat on your right, there is a link to the talk series as a whole, where you can register for some of the other talks by other NSSR profs. The series was conceived by myself and Robert Kosheva, the vice dean here at the NSSR, with the following thought. There are plenty of journalistic venues that you can turn to for uh, answers to questions you already have, but universities are a place in which questions that you don't already have are raised, and also places that equip you with the tools to answer them. And the goal of this series is to make that manifest. And the series is titled The Current Moment uh, for a reason. It's meant very expansively. It refers primarily, in the first instance, to the novel coronavirus pandemic and quarantine that we're all experiencing and trying to, to make sense of. But it also refers in a bigger picture to the impending global ecological catastrophe, which is going to be the core subject of, of Jay's talk today. But the phrase has also taken on a new meaning with the events of the past few days here in New York and elsewhere in response to the persistent unchecked scourge of police violence against black Americans. There's been a kind of public recognition of an ethical crisis that we need to confront. And I hope that will be one of the topics that comes up in our, our Q&A today. And Additionally, Robert Kristeva and myself were talking this morning about adding uh, a meeting to the series, another talk, to address that very current issue explicitly. That said, I'd like to introduce a couple of people. First, uh, Miranda Young, who is a PhD student in the philosophy department, who's going to help me moderate the talk just to keep track of the, the questions and kind of keep the discussion focused. And then our speaker, Jay Bernstein, who is the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy here at the NSSR. He's the author of many books and articles. Uh, the only one I have handy is his, is his book on Adorno from 20 years ago. But he has a more recent book entitled Torture and Dignity, an essay on moral injury that I highly, highly recommend. And I assume will be in the background of some of the things he's thinking about. We'll see. One hard novel question that Jay's work raises that I think this talk is gonna address is what happens when we're confronted with moral problems that are unthinkable? Not just in the sense that they're unimaginable, that they're just hard or difficult to think about in virtue of their complexity, but in the sense that we lack, we currently lack the moral vocabulary to make sense of what's morally at stake in them. And I think one question Jay's gonna address is, is the impending global ecological catastrophe one such moral problem? And if so, how do the moral concepts of right and responsibilities need to be rethought by us in the face of it in order to make sense of it? That said, I'd like to welcome Jay to give us his talk entitled Of Ecocide and Human Rights on the Ethical Tragedy of Climate Change. There will be a half hour talk, roughly half hours, a half hour, and then we'll jump right into a Q&A. And there'll be two ways in which you can ask questions. One is 
through the Q&A window, which is its own specific window, you can type in questions. And another is to raise your hand and we'll call on you. So either of those are open. Um, that said, thanks, Jay. Let's jump right into it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I am delighted to be here and delighted to be uh, talking to you all. Um, this is gonna be a, a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna bring up the PowerPoint uh, now and uh, I will begin. Okay, is the PowerPoint okay for all of you? It looks good. You gotta start, start slideshow, but it looks good. Okay. There yet? Yeah, we see it, yeah. Okay, great. Oh, but Jay, you gotta go to, it's not just the PowerPoint, it's also the slide of the, the side of the PowerPoint. So go up to slideshow mm -hmm. on your PowerPoint screen. Yep. Uh, and then do, oh no, to the right. Uh, to the right more, to the right more. Slideshow, okay. Slideshow and then play from start, yeah. Play from the start. And then... Why isn't it doing? Oh, there we go. It's good. All good. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. More things to learn. Okay. So, so even the European Union now thinks that after COVID-19, things must change and change radically. Certainly what they have in mind is that in case the recent surge of droughts and floods and the firestorm that engulfed Australia failed to do it. What the coronavirus makes evident is that the remote future of recurring natural disasters is already here. And that means that climate change issues about our obligations to future generations, to the global poor, to non-human nature, and the question of how we are going to reconstruct the economy after COVID is the same question. And I congratulate the European Union saw that immediately and is designing its package about the future around it. I think equally remarkable, however, is the global response to the COVID crisis, because I believe that it demonstrates that all the standard reasons against a radical politics of climate change are simply fallacious. That it is often said there's no money to deal with the climate change problem, but the COVID crisis demonstrates that funding is not the issue. We have the funds. It is sometimes said that responding to climate change is beyond the reach of governments to re structure the economy. But suddenly car manufacturers uh, know how to make ventilators and perfume manufacturers can make hand sanitizer. We can make green energy just fine. It is also sometimes said that ordinary citizens are simply unwilling to make the extreme sacrifices necessary. But ordinary citizens around the globe have shown themselves to be more than willing to make extraordinary sacrifices in this moment. And they have not only made extraordinary sacrifices, they are willing to radically transform their social practices when they see that there is a reason to do so. In short, the response to the COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated a capacity for radical social change that has been said to be impossible when it comes to climate change. Hence, responding to the climate change crisis does not concern those issues, but concerns simply and above all what I've always thought, a question of political will formation. Now that said, what is nonetheless missing uh, from the climate change argument is the outline of the political morality that would provide the normative foundations for a successor form of life to that of liberal capitalism. But to say this is equally to urge what I believe 
that liberal capitalism is and is now patently, for reasons I'll give, a failed form of life that urgently requires replacing. And in order to create a future for humanity, in order to create a sustainable form of life, we must reinvent, I think, the entirety of our moral vocabulary, as Ed hinted, I would argue. So as a way of opening this discussion, I want to argue that only an international law convention against ecocide and a socialist international law reconstruction of human rights are adequate to the task. So that's the project. That's going to be the argument I want to run. Okay, let me begin. As Stephen Gardner has pointedly already argued, the global environmental tragedy is most centrally an ethical failure and one that implicates our institutions, our moral and political theories, and ultimately ourselves as moral agents. In claiming that anthropogenically produced global climate change is an ethical failure, rather than an issue belonging narrowly to economics or technology or, or natural science, Gardner means that the central issue is the utterly manifest and excruciating inaction in response to the impending disaster. We have known about the damaging and fracturing of the earth system for more than 30 years and done nothing. On the contrary, CO2 levels have continued to rise and the latest findings from Noah Loa indicate that they are now at 416 parts per million, while the norm for the past 200,000 years has never been above 300 parts per million. Jeremy Davies summarizes the destruction in this way. The rough transition out of the Holocene has seen the deadening or searing away of one ecological community after another. Its keynote environmental effects have been depatterning and subordination to single authorities. In the clear cutting of forests, the draining of wetlands, the damming, dredging, channelization, and eutrophication of rivers, the exhaustion, salinization, contamination, and erosion of soil, the bottom trolling, strip mining, and ever expanding imposition of precarious, input saturated monocultures, complex ecologies have been dispersed and simplified in order to tame them in servicing the extractive demands of international capital. The continuing deterioration of the environment should be taken as revealing the blunt inethical, the ethical inadequacy of our existing political institutions and economic practices. And further, at least the emptiness of existing moral and political discourses, and at worst, their ethical complicity. All the dominant moral and political philosophies of liberal modernity have failed and failed radically. As a starting place, the climate crisis demonstrates that there now exist massive prima facie obligations that have not been addressed and arguably cannot be addressed within the confines of modern ethical thought. Gardner has argued that what matters most is what we do to protect those vulnerable to our actions and who are unable to hold us accountable. That is, the spatially disparate global poor, the temporally disparate future generations, and the ethically and metaphysically disparate non-human nature. 
Look at that three items. To state the obvious, the spatial and temporal structure and the metaphysical moral ontology of contemporary moral thought simply is inadequate, if not full out broken. Modern moral thought fails to comprehend the space of morality, the temporal parameters of moral concern, and the necessary objects of moral attention. Let me begin with three, the problem of non-human nature, In 1972, Olaf Palm, who was then the uh, Prime Minister of Sweden, argued that the US war in Vietnam was an ecocide. And since that time, there has been increasing pressure to recognize ecocide, the destruction of ecological systems. In the case of Vietnam, it was 16% of their ecological fabric was destroyed by US bombing and herbicides. Since that time, there has been this pressure to recognize ecocide as an international crime through which corporations and governments could be held to account for the severe and enduring damage to ecosystems that is now being caused. As Polly Higgins states it, there is a missing responsibility to protect. What is required is an expansion of our collective duty of care to protect the natural living world and all life. International ecocide crime is a law to protect the earth. Ecocide is not now regarded as a crime. Higgins' proposal is that ecocide be placed alongside and on a par with the other four crimes against peace. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes of aggression. The proposal that I am working at at the moment is to treat ecocide as a use cogent rule of international law. Use cogent means legal norms from which no derogation is permitted. No state can opt out. And at the moment, we recognize torture, slavery, genocide, crimes against humanity, aggressive war and apartheid as use cogent norms. These are meant to be a higher law beyond ordinary treaty-based international law. And they are where I think ecocide belongs. So my first hypothesis is this. Unless ecocide becomes a crime prosecutable by the International Criminal Court, or some analogous international court, it is difficult to imagine the tragedy of climate change even beginning to be politically addressed. State sovereignty, of course, is the emphatic antagonist of higher international law. Sovereignty involves the claim to a supremacy of the authority and exclusive jurisdiction of the state within a territory and over a population that signifies the coherence, the unity, and the independence of a territorially based legal and political community. State sovereignty has been the norm in political modernity. Nonetheless, beginning in 1945, with the Nuremberg trials, Sir Hartley Shawcross made a statement that has compelled many, namely, international law has in the past made some claim 
that there is a limit to the omnipotence of the state. And over, I'm sorry. Um, and that the individual human being, the ultimate unit of law, is not disentitled to the protection of mankind when the state tramples upon his rights in a manner which outrages the conscience of mankind. Something about what happened in Nazi Germany has led us to think so state sovereignty cannot be absolute. There has to be a veil that lifts it, a limit beyond which it cannot go. And the project to introduce such a limitation, that is the most practically charged critique of the sovereignty system, has come from the effort to transform international law from a treaty-based system among sovereign states to one premised on human rights, as if human rights were the effective constitutional principles of international law. So humanitarian international law, crimes against humanity, genocide convention, some human rights, in my view, are original moral inventions. They were invented sometime around 1948, 1949, into the 1950s. And they seem to me the most original works of moral invention since the moral inventions of the 18th century. The invention of moral reason by Kant and moral sentiment by human Rousseau, along with the vocabulary of natural rights. Almost all of modern morality is premised on the illusory moral ontology of individualism. As the categorical imperatives of international law, human rights intend an overcoming of the dualism between ideal morality, the categorical imperative, the principle of utility, and positive law. So the thought is that ideal abstract morality, oughts without any is to them, and legal positivism, laws without any moral authority, that these two poles, morality and law, are part of a fractured moral modernity. This emergent human rights are meant to overcome this dualism. So the thought is that this emergent and still surprising effort is that they, human rights, mean to be intrusions upon the sovereignty system, whereby the international community takes itself to be entitled to articulate and enforce moral principles and legal rules regulating the conduct of governments toward their own citizens. And what holds, of course, for the conduct of governments toward their own citizens, and here is where I've been going, should hold as well for the ecosystems within their jurisdiction. That is, without a radical human rights-based constitutionalization of international law, the global community will lack the ethical and political authority to hold states and corporations accountable for the damage to the environment they do, as well as their patent indifference to the welfare of their own subjects. That indifference is what we've been looking at for the past week. Okay, now, big story, big story that human rights are where we need to go. And one might at this juncture argue that human rights project is just too hopelessly compromised, too complicit to play the role I am assigning. 
And to this charge, I want to respond with a big yes and a big no. It is easy to demonstrate that when human rights first emerged in 1948, they were poised half by design, half by default, between two conflicting interpretations. They could either be interpreted as a moral extension and supplement to the rights of liberal capitalism that has liberal freedoms essential to democratic culture as its high point, or human rights could be interpreted as the grounding principles of the political morality for a post-liberal capitalist form of life, as the constitutive political morality of a socialism to come, where the dividing line between those two interpretations relates to the liberal claim for the primacy of negative rights, as exemplified in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, while the socialist interpretation opts for the primacy of positive social rights, as in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights the two 1966 covenants. I'm suggesting that it's not an accident that the 1948 declaration split into these two covenants, that they demonstrate the ambiguity in the original project and a conflict internal to it. Nonetheless, and it's this indeterminacy, by the way, that I think is the reason why it passed with near unanimity in, 1960, in 1948. Nonetheless, it's worth reminding ourselves that the debate over whether the United States should be a party to the Human Rights Convention in 1948, that the president of the American Bar Association said that human rights are a manifesto on pink paper, whose adoption would promote state socialism, if not communism, throughout the world. That view about human rights was the dominant view in 1948, in 1949. Only months after their passage, we know what happened, namely the Cold War intervened and tilted the ownership and reception of human rights back in the direction of liberal capitalism, where it has uneasily lingered ever since. I remind you that the United States has yet to sign the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Nonetheless, what had been hoped but not anticipated in 1948 was that there was to be an, an inconstant but emphatic emergence, growth, and development in human rights. And the most insistent sign of this is that over the past 70 years, human rights have become the primary international language of social justice and injustice. Social and political harms are now routinely referred to under the descriptions of being violations of human rights. I take it that's what we saw in Minneapolis. That said, the dynamic moment of the liberal capitalist expansion of human rights is today in obvious severe retreat. Human rights are now, I think, a stalled project along with the liberal part of liberal capitalism, that economic liberalism or neoliberalism always intertwined with liberalism has overtaken its political hosts. 
And hence, if the language of human rights is the lingua franca of social justice, and this was my opening claim about the ethical tragedy of climate change, the project of social justice in the contemporary world is also stalled. With the patent reason for this being evident, the form of life grounded in conscientious individualism of modern morality is simply inadequate to our present. Excuse me. Well, there might be conceivably other paths to reviving the politics of social justice. I am in fact unaware of any powerful and sustained challenge to human rights over the past decades that contains a potentially binding political morality. That's what we need, a binding political morality. So here are five theses toward a socialist reconstruction of human rights. First, the broad moral intuition behind human rights discourse is that there are some states of affairs that are simply morally intolerable. And they're intolerable because they are either physically non-survivable in the medium to long term, or they are morally destructive to the person. And yet, these intolerable states of affairs these conditions are in fact socially preventable. Again, what happened in Minneapolis didn't have to happen. It was preventable. Second, the criteria for moral intolerableness is helplessness. The fundamental purpose of human rights is to prevent or to eliminate insofar as possible the degree of vulnerability that leaves people at the mercy of others without security against violence or subsistence, food, shelter, etc. One is helpless. The obvious passages from Henry Shu, whose work on basic rights seems to me remarkable and remarkable in the way it's been ignored even within Anglo-American philosophy. Thesis three, existential helplessness coordinates with the four modern constitutive sources of human dependence. First, individuals are directly dependent on the goodwill of all spatially proximate other individuals. Secondly, individuals are dependent on the economic structures and processes which are systematically indifferent to the needs and welfare of individuals. Third, individuals are dependent on state practices and systems like education, the police, the law, the welfare system that are responsible for the so social and normative order of society. And fourth, individuals are dependent on the natural habitat, the natural environment for their well being. <coughs> Thesis four to be particularly rendered helpless with respect to any of these sources of constitutive dependence is to be effectively excluded from full and active participation in the life of society. And when that occurs, when one is forced to suffer street or domestic violence, police violence, the violence of poverty, 
the violence of failures of resources and legal protection, when all those failures, the failure to protect one from natural disaster, when those failures to protect occur, when the state tolerates predictable forms of helplessness that arise through these means, it discounts the value of the life of those so affected. One no longer counts as being a citizen. One is no longer recognized as having a full human status. Thesis five then, the determinate negation of the systematic and predictable social causes of preventable helplessness would be a schedule of basic human rights, which collectively would provide the minimum necessary conditions for full and active participation in the life of society. Now, although it's a matter of historical dispute, my own view is that this is actually the argument that Marx puts forward in On the Jewish Question, text that is often wildly misread, where he plainly is arguing that human rights provide the minimum necessary conditions for full and active participation in cultural, economic, and political life. The schedule of human rights is derived again from being the determinate negation of the systematic and predictable sources of human helplessness. To which we must now add one final proviso. Helplessness before the environment is also helplessness before the economy and the polity, since they jointly have exploited the vulnerabilities of the earth system making non-human nature increasingly disturbed, dangerous, and potentially inhospitable to human living. So thoroughly has this been the case that there is now the geological proposal that the hospitable and stable ecological system that reigned throughout the entire history of human civilization beginning 11,700 years ago, the Holocene epoch has disappeared to be replaced by a disturbed and erratic earth system, the Anthropocene. Minimally, to acknowledge the existence of the Anthropocene requires acknowledging that our contemporary form of life is essentially ecocidal. It destroyed the Holocene conditions of human life that reigned for nearly 12,000 years. Hence, to acknowledge the Anthropocene requires acknowledging our collective responsibility for the well being of the Earth system. And what would that count? What would count as collective responsibility for the Earth system? I think the first act of such a work of collective responsibility would be the installation of an international ecocide convention. My conclusion then is, is that even if human rights are ethically foundational from a practical point of view for a constitutionalization of international law, I think if the rights regime is ever to come, it will almost certainly be because of the urgency of the ethical tragedy of climate change and that it alone will motivate the coming to be of an international legal regime capable of protecting the earth and its citizens. My thesis then is if the global tragedy of climate change is to be addressed and protection offered to the global poor, future generations 
and non-human nature, then we will acquire a new form of life. I call it ecological socialism, and that this new form of life will have an ecocide convention and human rights as its founding principles. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, <laughs> wish there a way to Woo. have an audible, you know, applause. So we'll have to just okay. imagine it. <laughs> I, I think I'll start us off by just asking you a rather open-ended question about the third of the crises that I mentioned in the intro, the kind of recent outbreak of the persistent scourge of police violence that you referenced in, in Minneapolis. You know, so we have yet another case of police violence against a black American caught on video and um, it's led to many calls for justice. And I wonder how you think what you've said here in this, in, you know, very big picture uh, account applies to that, you know, contemporary American problematic. Right. So, so one of the things that has concerned me um, for a while and it first concern, it didn't first concern me when Black Lives Matters first arose. When Black Lives Matter first arose, it was and it was patently a human rights project. And for whatever reasons, it at a certain moment decided it wanted to be both wider and did not want that focus. And I think this is a systematic failing of the American left that it has tolerated, and I don't say all the left, one of the things I love about what Sanders has been arguing is he keeps saying, right, healthcare is a human right, over and over again. The US Constitution has provided an excuse for federalism and for ignoring human rights. So what I want to say is I think that the chances of radical reform to our criminal justice system require a wider framework, that they should put themselves on a footing with all the rest of what we think of as, as international criminal law, right? To just stop US exceptionalism, to make human rights the founding principles here. And that I think we will find that, that those give a firmer moral foundation to those arguments that, that they will give, uh, rather than pointing to the Constitution or whatever it is, are pointed to. And often nothing is pointed to. Often the arguments are about, and understandably about, an impossible history of domination, repression, lynching, of the continuation of a project uh, that is rooted in slavery. I nonetheless think that politics has to be more forward looking than backward looking. Uh, that seems to me where I'd want to go. And it seems to me that a human rights framework as I issued right here, that these are, let me put, the statement clear again. Minimum necessary conditions for full and active participation in the life of society. If you can't get educated, if you can't eat, if you are afraid to live while being black, can't go in your front door, can't sit in the dorm, can't, you know, can't bird watch. If just those actions are impossible, then you have not been recognized as an equal citizen. So, so I think human rights is a more effective ethical framework than anything that now exists. Okay, great. So Eddie has a question that relates to this, which is about, you know, just as there can be these uses of new social technologies, there can also be abuses of them. So Eddie draws attention to the way in which, you know, human rights discourse was used to justify the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Yep. And then at the end of his comment, he says, he imagined something like the fact 
that certain US foreign policy officials have already begun to use the empirical fact of China being the world's foremost polluter as a rationale for certain geopolitical imperatives. So are there any safeguards to this, you know, the human rights discourse being abused in, in that way, I think is the worry. Sure. So, so the first thing I want to say, and it will make some people uncomfortable, is it seems to me the notion of moral safeguards is almost equivalent to the idea of a moral absolute that cannot be compromised by politics. And everything I am saying is against that. Now this debate, I want to say, goes back to the beginning of philosophy. If I had to date the first day of philosophy, it's in the Crito, where Crito says to Socrates, escape from prison because you have been unjustly accused and unjustly punished. And Socrates, and it's not a debate between procedural justice versus substantive justice, although it's sometimes put that way. It's the question of recognizing, which Socrates did recognize, that polit political life can go wrong. That legal and political life is life for what I call a morality for adults. Political moral purity, right, is will drive you inevitably into moral rationalism. So, so the first thing I want to say is there are no absolute safeguards. What I am looking for is a reconstruction, right? So I don't want to deny, as I said, a big yes and a big no. Human rights have been misused, have been compromised, have been dominated by their liberal interpretation. That's my assumption. But I am saying that the project has continued because people continue to hear in it something else. And my five theses are meant to interpret what that something else is that should drive a politics of human rights that would support the international legal program. So, so what I want to do is say, we don't have that kind of safeguards in the real world. And the search for it is what produces bad moral philosophy. I got to ask a follow-up question then. Yeah, so you mentioned, you know, moral rationalism as a, a wrong turn. And I wonder if you could say, what do you think at the most, at the deepest level is, is mistaken when we make that turn? You know, what's, what, what is so wrong about that turn? Right. So, so I interpret moral rationalism beginning with Plato in the Crito, right? He wanted ideal justice. And the thought of ideal justice is that these are ideals that have no anchor in existing social practices. So, so my view is, is that the separation of, um, and law has a wonderful distinction here, technical Latin distinction, lex lata versus lex ferenda which is law as it is versus law as it should be. Now, this is weird if you think about it because law itself is a normative system. It's a system of norms. And yet they distinguish between law as it is and law as it should be. Um, my view is that normativity means law as it is. What makes law potent is not that there be some ideal, what Plato wanted, but that law is essentially self-critical, that it is a project of overcoming itself again and again and again. So where ideal justice seeks for some moral perfection, my claim is that oughts rooted in the world can matter because we are capable of ongoing critical inquiry. 
that law is a self-critical practice. And we call that self-critical practice the rule of law and be another lecture. That's great. So I'm going to call on Miriam, if you're there, we're going to have you ask your question yourself. Let's see if this works. Miriam? No, okay, we'll come back to you. Can you, Miriam, contact me in the chat if you're ready to ask your question. I'll ask uh, uh, another question from the, from the Q&A, from Danielle. Will ecocide ever be seen with the same outrage as genocide or war crimes? And what are the steps needed to have it be taken seriously by the world? Mm. What, a, what a great question. So, so there's an argument by a guy named Eric Katz from about 20 years ago that argued against ecocide on the grounds that it sounded too much like genocide and, and, and therefore wanted the same level of moral outrage. And, and my response to that is again, that this is using a certain paradigm of moral outrage as if it were exclusive, as if our horror at the Holocaust has to be the same is as our horror against the disappearance of certain species of fish. That seems to me in a way again, the wrong question. We have to have, and, and uh, I would ask anyone uh, interested to read Richard Powers' The Overstory, which is about trees. It's a novel about trees. And it's about being horrified at the disappearance of, of old growth forests in America. We're capable of different kinds of horror. And we first of all have to recognize that horror at this is a horror at the destruction of the life support system that has held you made human life possible for the last 12,000 years. So there are grounds for horror. It may not look like the same horror, but it's a kind of horror. Secondly, there's been a couple of really interesting cases, but think about Vietnam, where efforts of ecocide are part of genocidal projects, that you destroy peoples by destroying the conditions of their living. So, so on the one hand, I want to say, discriminate. We don't need to have one kind of horror, one kind of, of paradigm of, of what, um, otherwise the environment won't enter in. On the other hand, they're not disconnected. In the modern world, um, most of what's going to count as genocides will probably happen through ecocides. Oh, I lost my audio there. That's great. <laughs> um, so Jay, here's, a, a, here's a, a different kind of question from Kean, and I think it connects up with rethinking moral vocabularies in the wake of this unprecedented problem. And it, it addresses, it, it concerns how we need to rethink the notion of moral responsibility. Right. So I'll, I'll read Kean's question because it's very well put. Mm -hmm. Who would be the targets of an ecocide charge? In terms of climate change, we face a large problem which involves the contributions of many smaller and larger contributors, including every single person. Developed country citizens contribute far more than developing country citizens on average, but are dwarfed again by firms and sectors with large natural resource demands. Here's the crucial claim. It seems arbit. Oh, no. It uh, Kieran, I, Kieran, I think, oh no, it just jumped, sorry. <laughs> uh, it seems arbitrary to assign responsibility to some of these as opposed to others, even though some are much larger contributors. And then there's a final problem, of course, the other issue is that these emissions were legal at the time when they happened, so it's unclear how new international law would apply retroactively. But I take it the underlying question is one about responsibility. There's not one person or one corporation that we can identify as the cause 
of climate change. So how, how do we need to think through the moral responsibility involved in a new light? Okay, so, so this is a, a, the perfect nerd question um, to which I wanna give up just a simple two part answer. On the one hand, uh, Polly Higgins herself was interested in what she calls ascertainable ecocides. That is where we know who the polluter is and Exxon Mobil, we know what they did and we can hold them responsible. And those are backward looking uh, acts of, of destruction to, to uh, ecosystems. But the larger question has to be different. And this is why the Anthropocene business comes in here. What we've discovered over the past um, 30 years is that certain types of conduct, say emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, cause climate changes. Those erratic changes cause severities that were not present previously, new droughts, new flooding, new hurricanes, that themselves are the cause of the ecocide. So the first and dominant moment of an ecocidal principle will be the prohibition on certain conduct. Just like you're not allowed to do certain things, you're not allowed to emit CO2 into the atmosphere. And that I think would be the first principle of an ecocide convention. That is making certain conducts because we know that they destroyed the Holocene. We therefore know causally that those conducts do it. And that would be a future looking. So the idea of an ecocide convention is it has ascertainable acts of ecocide which are backward looking and forward looking ones, right? Making certain conduct prohibited. And then there's a further problem, namely these are acts of mitigation. And then there's a question of who pays for adaptation to the new situation. And that's not ecocide, but a, a further problem within environmental policy. That's really, really interesting. I'm going to call on Miranda to help me out here and make sure I'm not missing any of the great questions that are out there. Yeah. Hi, Jay. So this Hi. was great. Um, and definitely as someone who had sat in or had taken your human rights seminar a couple years ago, it's really interesting to see how some of the theories that we work through and some of the central theses from that class, like sort of come new in this pressing moment. And I guess there's so many great questions uh, in the Q&A. And so maybe I just actually want to kind of uh, read uh, Dan Baskov Ellen's question um, and, and sort of in hopes that I, um, I share similar concerns. So Dan says, hi Jay, thanks for the talk. As you know, I fully agree with you about the failure of the liberal capitalist order and the need for a global uh, eco-socialist politics and ethics. I'm curious, however, about whether you think the centrality of human rights in your vision has a chance of further entrenching the strong anthropocentrism and externalization of nature that capitalism and liberalism have helped to normalize. So compared to say some indigenous belief systems. So it's a, you know, I think the question of like a human right and a non-human right and like how we sort of distinguish between them is like central to this question. And I share uh, the same thoughts. So great. So, so um, the first thing I want to say, and it really matters, is that I'm interested uh, in a political legal horizon stretching just to the remainder of this century, just 80 years. I can't want more because I think the crisis is so urgent. Because I think the crisis is so urgent. Um, so one of the things I'm thinking about is that we need a ethical, political morality that can take us from where we are to a possible sustainable future, right? We need to stop emitting 
CO2 into the atmosphere. We need principles of mitigation and adaptation as a matter of urgency. And, and my claim is that um, I do not, for, for all the reasons that Dan suggested, the turn that I do not make here is say that people have a human right to a clean environment. I agree that argument seems to me to have failed and failed terribly. So by going for ecocide as the dominant idea and of tying my argument to the Anthropocene, I am arguing for a form of biocentrism. And, and my thought here is, is simply the following. Uh, uh, the way I work at it in the, the long version of this project is to say that ecocide is not an expansion of existing ethical practices to take in formally excluded beings. That's the standard picture. We only thought that human beings were proper moral objects. And then we thought, no, 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 what, what about, you know, pussycats? Okay, then we'll say that, you know, people with feelings, everything counts, and then we have to go beyond that. I don't have an expansive view. Rather, the Anthropocene argument is the argument that we discover that we have always already been living beings in a living environment that our social practices are practices of ecological engineering. That's the other right description of them. We are foremost amazing ecological engineers and our forms of ecological engineering have been destructive to the very habitat we have reconstructed. So, so I don't think the human rights exist within a reconception of human social practices as themselves forms of participating in a living and natural environment. Um, on the other hand, I really do want to defend human rights. I want to defend the thought that people require full and active participation in the life of their societies. And everything else is going to be a form of denial of equal standing. So those two things do not seem to me in contradiction. And I do not think using human rights in the way I do, namely a wholly social practice based constructive account. I construct human rights from right, sources of, of helplessness, just as I construct the ecocide convention from destruction of the environment. That is, I'm always doing a constructive normative project, not relying on existing norms. And I didn't see that the project has that anthropocentrism. So. Omri has a related question, so I'll throw it out there, which is, yeah. he, he notes that, um, you know, people on the left have often been opposed to the idea of human rights on the grounds that it presupposes a metaphysical notion of the human. Right. And Omri wonders, so how, how are you understanding, you know, the human in the context of human rights? Right. Okay, so, so I can't do the whole 100,000 words I have on human rights, uh, but here's uh, my way around that issue. I do have a, a, a dignitarian view about human rights. That is, I think human rights are for the sake of securing the intrinsic worth of individuals. However, I do not regard uh, dignity as a metaphysical item. I call it a meta value. That is, it's a way of interpreting our ways of valuing. So human rights for me are a constructive project through which we ask the question, what forms of practice will count as showing that human lives have intrinsic and not merely instrumental worth? And the reason I think that's the way to go, 
um, is that behind my project, I haven't mentioned it all here, is an interpretation of the present by Karl Polanyi. And he said what distinguishes liberal capitalism is that it turns land, labor, and money into commodities without restraint. So my argument is, what would it be to not treat land or labor as unrestrictedly commodities, namely as having a standing in themselves? And lo and behold, <laughs> it turns out that having an ecocide convention and having human rights is actually sufficient to show that humans and land are not uh, unrestricted commodities. So there's a whole uh, argument here against instrumental reason and between instrumental rationality and ends rationality, but at, again, done constructively without any metaphysics. We've simply discovered because of the nature of the harms of commodification that we need this notion of intrinsic value, just as environmentalism discovered because of, and this is, goes right back to Leopold, right? Uh, Sand County all in that. The harms done to the ecological fabric show that it couldn't be a mere commodity either. Oh, that's great. That's really helpful. I'm going to end with one last question from Andrew. That's uh, a nicely specific question about one of the kind of sources that you're drawing from, which is Wittgenstein's notion of a form of life. Mm -hmm. And Andrew notes uh, two different ways of reading the notion of form of life. He identifies one with Stanley Cavell. He calls it a, a naturalist monist reading, where I assume the uh, suggestion is supposed to be on that reading, there's only one thing that is the human form of life. That, you know, form of life here doesn't pick out one possibility among many, it's, it's, it's unitary. And Andrew contrasts that with Peter Hacker's reading, um, which he calls a kind of cultural pluralist reading, where the suggestion there is, yeah, there's, there's more than one possible form of life. And uh, so I guess the question is, um, how are you understanding form of life here? And, 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 and more generally, you know, what's the ethical significance of form of life on your reading? How does it, how does it have a kind of evaluative, uh, you know, significance? That's great. That's, that's great. So, so, of course, behind my thought about forms of life um, is the thought that was there in Dan's question, by the way, um, is there are competing foundational understandings for what it means to live a human life at all. Um, and and because I begin with the thought that climate change has been an ethical failure, then I'm thinking that something in our deepest self-understanding of what it is to be a human living in a natural world, that that big picture thought has gone terribly wrong. So I consider forms of life, uh, borrowing from Rahel, Rahel Yegi, to be issues of solving problems. But problems at the level of civilizations, not at the level of narrow communities. That, that we are at a moment where we are being asked to reconsider the very possibility or meaning of, of human living whatsoever. Um, that, and I, this is a longer argument, but I now think that we can reconstruct a great deal of what we call philosophy by thinking of it in terms of taking Holocene normativity for granted. This is what nature is. We live in nature. Now let's figure out what human life should be. The Holocene, which turns out to be contingent, not necessary, Holocene normativity 
has been the presupposed background for civilizational projects. And I now think, right, that we not only have, we now must become aware that we have presupposed Holocene normativity, we've in fact destroyed it. And therefore the very notion of civilization, beginning, you know, I'm, I'm beginning, right, Holocene begins when agrarian civilization begins. The timing is exact, <laughs> when we become settled. Settled humanity has presupposed that Holocene background. We no longer can, we are a force of nature. That seems to me at such a level when we become capable and then hence collectively responsible for nature, we really are inhabiting a different form of life than our predecessors. So, so it's not, um, there are multiple human forms of life uh, and there have been, but we must leave one behind that has two intolerable premises, right? Holocene normativity and anthropocentrism. Giving up them is giving up a whole lot that we considered absolute. That's really, really suggestive. So that's a great way to end. This was a uh, very provocative and informative. So thanks, Jay. I uh, hope everybody will join me in, in remotely thanking you for uh, I us. Hope, I hope if people have questions, email me. I love to, this is a new project. So I'd love to hear from you. That's a wonderful invitation. Okay, so thanks uh, everybody for joining us and hope to see you on Thursday. Uh, Miranda's just posted the talk schedule which is available online and register for the talks and join us. So thanks everybody. Great seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for thanks. all the questions. Ciao.